Hi, BLR. Uh, my name is Maureen Miller. I'm a graduate of NYU School of Medicine and the residency at Bellevue Hospital in Pathology. And I'm thrilled to have here with me today, Mark Rigney, the author of a story in issue three of the Bellevue Literary Review called The Facts. Now, when I read the Bellevue Literary Review, just as a casual reader, as I've been doing since medical school, I think of it as a very serious publication interested in realist fiction. Uh, and this piece uh, stood out to me when I was reading the archives as this antic and comic piece that I just adored the second I saw it. Um, it the, the title, The Facts, is, uh, reminded me of a work by Philip Roth, also called The Facts, which plays with autobiography and fiction. Um, and also the work of Jonathan Franzen, similarly in the period of, because this came out, I guess, around the time the corrections came out. and. Uh, there seem to be similarities in the lyric style and uh, the, it, it's got a lot of flair. So, I mean, it comes across as a really bold voice and to hear it from somebody that we don't know as much about who is coming as a writer from the Midwest, I think is just, I, I get really thrilled when I learn about unknown writers. So uh, in that, just a brief intro to the story. Uh, this discusses an elderly man named Lewis Kohler who dies somewhat mysteriously at a lake. And uh, the investigation seems to focus in the local media on two of his home health caretakers, uh, one of whom is an, a black man named Morris and another of whom is a cantankerous white woman named Kaylee. Uh, at least based on my own uh, recollections of the time, characters like these really did not appear as often in stories. They're more common now in like what I guess you would call messy fiction or or something of that nature, but I really liked how vivid they are. And there's a lot of play with like media satire, healthcare satire. And uh, the fact that it was published over 20 years ago, right after 9-11 is really unbelievable. In some ways it's so prescient about the precarity of the healthcare economy. Uh, so with that, I think I'll have you take it away here, Mark, but uh, please, if you want to add any more information, feel free. Great, uh, thank you. That was very, very kind. I, I don't think of it as being prescient, but then again, I don't work in the health sector. I occasionally write about it. So it's interesting to hear that, that it strikes you as, as you know, still vital and contemporary and 20 years on. End of story. On to the epilogues. Kaylee Linderbuck continued her stint with home health for another seven years, during which time she applied for disability leave on five separate occasions, four of which were granted. She died of a heart attack while bobbing unhappily through a water aerobics class at Home Health's private health club. 73 mourners turned up for her funeral service, 63 more than had attended the memorial for Lewis Kohler. Morris S. Miles, thinking of Sarah Seltzer, racking his brains to remember her touch, sank into a fierce and crippling bout of depression, a lonesome struggle which saw him move through three Ohio cities in less than two years, always one step ahead of Sarah and two steps behind his mordant sense of guilt. He tried churches, he tried dating, he tried drugs. For a time, he was addicted to painkillers, sleeping pills and caffeine all at once. He took up bowling. He participated in the making of an amateur X-rated movie, but felt nothing, neither joy nor revulsion. And he quit before the lunchtime break was called. He joined a cult and became, for a period of almost three weeks, shining star, master of his own destiny, blessed child of the cosmos. He developed a liking for canned pears, and it was this more than anything else that drew him back to the world, to a world stuffed full of miracles, miracles like lakes and joggers, white and black crappies, girls on bikes with clackety training wheels, and women so fat they could buckle a floor. Morris moved one last time to Alaska, a fact the newspapers missed, for they were on to the next scent, something about abuse in the public schools and how someone would have to pay and heads would roll. And it happened, too, but only after a special crimes unit took charge. In Alaska, we lose sight of Morris, for the papers there are different, consumed as they are with local road conditions and the 40,000 names for snow. It wasn't hard for Morris, a grim black man in a snow-white uniform, to blend into Alaska's hospitals and background checks as if he had always been there, as if he had always been faultless in his work. For Lewis, there can be no epilogue, except to remember that for all the details added here, for all our pathetic attempts to do justice to his life, we have only begun to discern the steps of his dance, the pattern of his music, and the marvel of all that we must miss. The end. <laughs> 
how did it feel to read that after 20 years? Is that the first time you've seen it since? Is that I, well, I have looked at it uh, more recently than 20 years, but I certainly hadn't intended to read it aloud. And what I was really struck by was there's a sense, at least for me, of the story being kind of impatient that I, <laughs> I'm not sure if that was me as the author or, or some sort of omniscient voice I adopted, but it feels like First of all, a real impatience with uh, the press and the way we get information, and then just an impatience with how little we can know about other people. And it's it's definitely struck me as the main, I don't know, the main force, the visceral part of it now. But would you attribute that to a personal evolution, a stylistic evolution as a writer? Because I've read some of your more recent work as a result of, of finding this, and it seems like the tone is, at least to me, fairly consistent across the work. Oh, huh, interesting. Um, I would say that in 2002, I was probably pretty sleep deprived. I have two kids and they're now 23 and 19. But at the time, the first one who was a terrible sleeper was two and a half or, well, gosh, I must have written this in 2001. It probably took a while to shop it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he was one, one and a half years old, lousy sleeper. And uh, I was up almost every night dealing with that. And so I think that probably some of that uh, high-speed caffeinated energy as far yeah. as the story go. There's phrases like these very dense alliterations, sky then sickle versus Barbie and bells. Mm. Uh, there are a couple other wonderful, helpless, world-class Caucasian. Everything has like three or four adjectives in front of it. So so that, ener that, that manic energy that you mentioned is definitely there, but I think it's uh, very efficacious the way you do it. So it doesn't feel overwhelming in that way. I, I like caffeinated, feels like very effervescent. And I, I think that's nice. Yeah. I, so I, I guess maybe getting more to the characterization that uh, the character of Kaylee immediately jumped out at me that uh, especially after the COVID pandemic, which is still going on, of, of course, we think of the front lines, how we glorify the workers on the front lines. We think that they are saints. We know they've been through hell. But this is a woman who's, at least in my reading, has been through hell for a very long portion of her career. I, I think this is where I was starting to think prescient work. Uh, and she's resentful. Uh, I, I mean, is that something that was intentional to you? Was that based on anything you had observed in your own experience with your family? Well, it's funny. I mean, maybe I was really uh, making a, a leap to where I am now. I know a lot more about healthcare workers than I did then. And, and for better or for worse, I now have direct experience and have interacted with a large number of them at the time. Uh, Kaylee and Morris both were completely made up out of whole cloth. So if they mm -hmm. strike you as real and, and fully fledged, then lucky me, because yeah. I didn't really have a lot to draw on. Check, check. Um, it just seemed, it didn't seem to make sense that, it, that that would be a field where people would get a ton of satisfaction, especially if they were moving from client to client a lot. That, I could be wrong about that, but it just seems difficult to, for me to imagine someone feeling really grounded and fulfilled. And then if the client is also a difficult person, it can only get worse from there. So um, yeah, that's kind of where she came from. I don't know if I would treat her differently now. In the last 20 years, as, as for better or for worse, we talk more about identity and identity politics. Just the physical description of Kaylee I would probably do it differently and I'm not sure how, but I, I did want her to be a very large person. And yeah. I wanted to contrast with Morris, who's a very small person and to see how that would work. So uh, it is what it is, it's in print and yeah. No, that's interesting that you say that. I, I mean, I, I wasn't thinking of this when I first read, but it also plays with the density of information that I, I mean, you quote, um, obituaries and local news articles. So I mean that there's a lot of play about like what is revealed versus what is concealed about a character. And you could think of the uh, weight of the person as somewhat of like a motif representing that. That might be an overdetermined thing, but uh, I guess you also mentioned identity politics. And one thing that I found very interesting about this is the sense of like uh, ancestry. There's uh, references to indigenous uh, inheritance of the land like you talk about it be the, the lake where lewis died being on shawnee land and there are several um references to uh, where names are derived or who owns a place or not uh, so I, I i mean what was your thought process doing that has that been an interest of yours for a long period 
I, I think I'm interested in what uh, in memory in general. This this story certainly strikes me as a kind of memory piece, and because it, it's based on an actual newspaper clipping that I bumped into, there really was a drowning. Antrim Park is a real place. It's in Northwest Columbus, Ohio, mm -hmm. and I'd read some tiny little snippet about someone in a wheelchair who who drowned, and I thought, how can that be? Why would someone leave someone in a wheelchair to roll into the lake? There should be somebody there with them, and and so I invented a story to explain it, and. And all the things that weren't in the clipping became this, I suppose, this sort of a diatribe about all the things we've left out. And that's why the ancestry and the history of the place itself uh, are all thrown in there, because, of course, no one's going to pay attention to that in investigating what might be a crime or what might just be an unfortunate accident. There seems to be a consistent interest, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, and like, like you, you do very moral work, but it's not didactic moral work it's like, like you 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 laugh the characters seem three-dimensional they seem like reasonable people so i i i mean like i thought of writers like flannery o'connor like do you do you think of yourself as a writer of like moral or spiritual fiction i think it could be seen that way i i don't attend any kind of religious congregation but okay. i was raised in one um and a great many of my friends are are people great convictions. So I suppose that element is in there. I do think a lot of my characters are kind of well behaved. Yeah. I, I, kind of, <laughs> I sometimes wish they would be worse behaved. So although I also write plays and in the plays, they tend to behave very badly indeed. I don't know if that's because they get to be physicalized more and I'm not in their heads. Um, I don't know if I think of myself as writing moral stuff, but I'm very glad to hear that you don't think it's didactic because if there's one thing that I think is the enemy and the death of fiction, that's it. So if I haven't strayed into that territory, that makes me very happy. No, no, that's great. I mean, I think just as, as a student, that's something that comes up a lot, that there's a, a movement at NYU and Bellevue and elsewhere called narrative medicine, where uh, we there's an interest in using fiction and other forms of art to like effectively process, I hate that term, but to, to talk about your practice. And uh, in so doing, there's a tendency to want to get the right answer or be serious or look like you don't have controversial emotions like you're talking about with Kaylee. Um, I, I was actually interested since you said people behaving badly. There is one character in this story, Sarah, who behaves very badly. Did you have any um, comments on how you generated this character who has a relationship with Morris uh, from a previous caretaking incident? Yeah, well, I think there's some questions as to whether she is, in fact, unstable. You know, that's a slippery slope. How we, in the last, hmm, well, in my adult life, I'd say that the, the playground word that something is crazy or that someone is crazy has now been kind of put as, it, there are people making an effort not to say that because it's too easy, right? We throw this epithet around, well, what is crazy? Yeah. And how do, are we labeling someone in a way that they then can't escape? And how serious is that? Is it something that's just essentially meaningless. Hey, so-and-so is crazy. That's a crazy thing. Did you see that crazy thing I just saw? Yeah. But it can it can start to have uh, real weight. Um, so I, that character that you're talking about in the story, I don't really explore her very much. She doesn't, she doesn't get a lot of page time. So I don't think we ever really know by the end. One of the things, not just about short stories, but in, in fiction in general, and plays maybe even more so, it's it's kind of like sculpting, right? You're you're excising things as fast as you can because you can't include everything, and so you wind up taking most things away and just trying to leave a few things that stand in for hopefully whatever it is you're trying to do. So there's as little of Sarah in there as I could get away with and still keep her, and still keep the story being a short story. Yeah, no, that's right. I, I mean, I feel like there's definitely enough material for a novel here, but it's it's, it's well sculpted. That, but for context, I, I should have said before that uh, Sarah is the daughter of a previous client uh, that, that Morris is hired to help, and they there's sort of a Me Too story that that goes on an ambiguous sexual relationship that uh, nobody really knows what happened. Uh, so then Morris throughout the story uh, in taking care of this new client, Lewis, who is the one who's the catalyst of the, the story uh, develops. But uh, going back to plays here, uh, how do you see writing plays as different from writing fiction? Some people can't do both genres, but this is very controlled. And the the plays are like a completely different direction. So, so like, what are your thoughts about that? The only way for me to tell you what I'm thinking on stage is to do something. 
So you have a very limited toolbox, or at least a different toolbox, whereas in prose, you can delve into anyone's thought process that you like. And in some sense, that's a gift because you have that freedom. But sometimes the best stuff comes out of having shackles, right? You, you yeah. wind up dealing with yeah. problems. Yeah, the constraints can make for inspiration. So yeah, it cuts both ways, but that's the main thing. You don't have access to characters' thoughts. And even if they say something in dialogue, it may or may not be true. And some other character then has to interpret whether or not it's true. Whereas on a, on a prose page, if you hear a character's innermost thought, that's as true as it gets. Um, I am curious, was reading the facts an emotional experience, and I'm not assuming that it would be, um, but I'm curious to know whether it had some other kind of impact on you as a reader. Yeah, no, when I first read this, I, I was into the comedy, but it actually did, and I'm, I'm going to pull why I picked the epilogue, basically, that the last line just, like, slayed me. For Lewis, there can be no epilogue, da-da-da. We've only begun to discern the steps of his dance, the pattern of his music, and the marvel of all that we must miss. And this story felt very real to me in a way that I would not have felt before starting medical school. So, like, I always hate, like, when you're reading blurbs on stuff, they'll say, like, an elegiac, like, like powerful, brutal novel. I, I don't like stuff like that, but this felt very sincere. It felt very plain spoken, and, like, I, I, I felt like it was, well, that's another MFA term, like, it felt like it was earned. Uh, yeah. but, but, like, I thought it was very, like, elegant and concise. I, I don't know, but, 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 yes, emotional for sure. That's it. So why do you ask that one? I'm just always interested with uh, about how things land. I feel like the full meal in fiction and in plays is for something to have emotional weight and not just a satisfying resolution or and or unsatisfying resolution. But I like something best of all that makes me laugh and then then rips my heart out. And I don't always know whether I can achieve whether I have achieved that because I'm rarely in touch with people who have actually read my work. Oh wow! Okay, that's. Well, if I am the first here, let me tell everybody at this benefit, you, you should read this guy's work. There are many people who are more famous who are not as interesting, in my opinion, and I don't, I don't mean that in a bad way. But. Oh, thank you. Can I ask you one other question? Yeah, uh, sure, please. In, in our back and forth, you mentioned something about the voice that you use as a doctor. And yeah. I'm interested in, on the one hand, I think people are used to talking about voice in fiction as if authors always have a hat that they've put on in crafting whatever writing gets out into the world. But I think we also, in our in our work, in our professions, in our relationships, we, we wear different hats. And I'm, I'm curious about how you, um, how you deal with the voice of being a professional medical practitioner and how you interact with patients. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting that you say that. I, I I thought about that question after reading Patterson by William Carlos Williams, where you it's like a epic poem where you can hear him struggling with the famous William Carlos Williams versus the one who's treating patients in Patterson and and so on in the history of the city. Uh, but I I mean, for example, when you see like the embroidery on your coat, you're like I knew people who duct taped their name off of it because they didn't want to be associated with like the brand, so to speak, that was them. Okay. Uh, so which I thought was interesting. I I think like I noticed my posture changes. It, 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 it's a very difficult question, mainly just because I didn't really want to be a doctor for a long time training. And so it felt like you were putting on a costume every day. You you, you feel like you have to, uh, as we were talking about with these, slow down your speech. The patients don't seem to care if you talk your normal speed, but the other doctors around you, like God help you if you talk too fast because it makes them anxious and they're trying to calm down themselves and everybody's like decision is to calibrate one another in this like difficult financial and social um, environment and culture clash. I, I do find that in the course of working on a, a piece where I know there's supposed to be something emotional happening, um, I'm not the only writer who has to trick myself into, into a kind of heightened state where either using music or by watching or, or reading something that I know I find emotionally affecting. And only after I get myself all worked up can I actually set down something new that is equally uh, forceful or emotional. And it's a kind of a, it's a trick that I don't enjoy playing 
because it feels like I ought to be able to do that by now, right? I ought to, I, in theory, I've been doing this so long and I've got enough of a body of work kind of stretched out behind me. I should be able to write anything at any moment and say, aha, I, I've waved my little magic wand. I know how to do that. It doesn't really work that way. There are moments yeah. when you really have to decide to put on what for you might be a lab coat and what for me might be a, a, an invisible, but a writer's hat and say, okay, now I'm this person. Now I'm working this way. And this is the, this is what I want to achieve by doing that. It doesn't always work, but yeah, it's always worth trying. <laughs> but the facts didn't take very long. And, and I know exactly when I knew I was on the right track. It was that, that early paragraph about um, girls on bikes, Barbie and bells versus sickle and scythe. When I wrote that, I went, okay, I think I've got something here. And if I can just maintain this tone from beginning to end, I think this will be a good story. And then Bellevue Review picked it up and I felt very validated. I, I find that a lot of journals don't have any focus or any theme. And that is nice when you're submitting because you know your story can fit because there is no theme, no matter what it's about. But um, I also do enjoy kind of knowing what I might get out of something. I think BLR is a terrific publication and I'm very pleased to have been in it, not just once, but more than once. So. I hope they keep going for a long time. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that's a great note to end on here that, I mean, it's been around for more than 20 years now. So you've yeah. been at the beginning and then in later stages. So uh, this man here writes horror, he writes science fiction, he writes plays, he writes comedies. This is Mark Rigney. If you've never read his work before, I encourage you to do so. And if you like me or a reader of the Bellevue Literary Review, please give money to have more small magazines proliferating in the world. Uh, so again, I'm Maureen Miller, uh, and Mark, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. This is our first meeting, but it was just fascinating conversation. So thank you. This has been a great, a great help to me. Thank you. It's great to meet you.